So let's just get it on the table. Do you believe in God? What do you mean by this? What do you mean by believe? What do you think happens to you if you do die? There are things that are far worse than dying. I mean, you've become somebody who, in the later stage of a life... Now you did it again. You got me again, God well, damn it. Welcome back to Rattlesnake TV, guys. In this video, we are going to be watching my internet father, Jordan Peterson's recent interview with Piers Morgan. They touched on some very interesting topics. It was a great interview and also one that hit pretty deeply for me personally. So with that, let's get into the clips. I interviewed uh, Steven Pinker recently and he, uh, he'd he always said for years that we've never had it so good uh, as a planet, mm -hmm. that statistically, whether it was poverty or health or age or whatever it may be, that on almost, on almost every recordable metric, this is the best time to ever be alive. And I asked him whether post the pandemic, the war in Ukraine, the cost of living crisis around the world, did he still feel that that held true? And he said, yes. But actually, despite that, this is the best time, actually, in, in, in many ways, to ever be alive. When I read your Twitter feed, which I find fascinating, exciting, uh, challenging, combative, but often quite furious, I get a sense of somebody quite angry with the state of the world. Is that a fair reflection of your state of mind about the world? If so, why? Well... We've, we've, we've swapped adventure for security. And Pinker rightly points to the fact that on the grounds of material security as well, satiety, satisfaction, let's say, we're doing better than we ever have. But people aren't built for infantile satiation. They're built for truthful adventure, as far as I'm concerned. And so to the degree that we've purchased security and and safety at the cost of existential adventure, that is not an advance. Now, I think, being optimistic like Pinker, that we could have an adventure. We could have our cake and eat it too. Let's put it that way. We could, we could make the world an abundant place and, and there would still be room for an adventure for everyone. But I think the, the existential or the, or the enlightenment types like Pinker, they make a mistake when they presume that mere material well-being is sufficient to, to, to provide people with the meaning that's, that's, a necessary, that's necessary to offset the fundamental existential uncertainty of their lives. You know, we're mortal creatures and we're, we're prone to decay and to the loss of everything that we have, even if we're rich. And you need a meaning that offsets that. And I don't think the Enlightenment types have done a good job of addressing that as, at all. They don't really understand or they refuse to understand the depth of that spiritual longing. Am I angry? Um, no, I wouldn't say precisely so. Um, I, I'm upset at many things that I see. I think the net zero move is, is, is a travesty in, in five different dimensions. I'm absolutely appalled that the globalist utopian elitists would sacrifice the poor to save the planet, especially when there's no evidence whatsoever that they're actually effectively saving the planet. And we could take Germany as a case in point there. And I would say the UK to some degree. Um, but I'm, I'm fundamentally optimistic. I think that people, I think that human beings can solve any problem that's set in front of them. And this is also another place where I think the apocalyptic utopians have got something seriously wrong. Like they basically take a zero sum approach to to economic analysis of the world. We have finite resources. There's only room for a certain number of people. And so, of course, that begs the question of what in your world you're going to do with all those excess people. And uh, we have to, you know, we have to move towards degrowth or there's going to be an apocalypse. And I think everything about that set of presuppositions is wrong. We don't live in a zero-sum universe. The apocalyptic outcome that everyone's predicting isn't necessary. And the more fundamental truth of the matter is, is that people... If people adopt subsidiary responsibility, and we could get into what that means, and we organize our social hierarchies effectively and generously, we could make the desert bloom. We can make much out of virtually nothing. And, and, that's, and human beings have that capacity because we can transform cognitively. And there's no reason to assume at all that we couldn't have more than enough for everyone. Now, that would mean those who want more for themselves 
then for other people would have to let go of that essentially power mad uh, desire and be willing to share and be willing to raise the poor out of poverty. And of course, doing so decreases the gap between rich and poor and that's very annoying if you're narcissistic and rich. I'm so glad that we have Jordan Peterson in the public eye. This man is a hero to me because he is not afraid to stand up to some of the worst people in the world and go against the narrative that has captured multiple generations. All we hear these days is how we are all going to burn and how you need to buy electric cars and stop eating meat so the weather can get gooder. You hear about how overpopulated we are and how we're destroying the earth and over farming and blah 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 Blah, 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 blah. Doom and gloom, the sky is falling. When in reality, if the decision making was in the hands of the right people, that we would have such an unbelievable capacity to make the world so much a better place for absolutely everybody that it almost makes you emotional with optimism when you actually see the numbers. And then when you start to see what the lowest standard of living in the world looks like and how little it would take to drastically change their life circumstances, such as reducing infant mortality rate, raising life expectancy, getting access to clean drinking water, stopping the spread of diseases, developing economies where they are so that they don't feel the need to get on rickety boats across the Mediterranean Sea and create better standards of education, not to mention the miracles that have already happened due to modern technology, then you would think twice about making energy more expensive for these places. And now onto the topic of truth and God, which is not only something that I find quite moving intellectually and philosophically, but also on a personal level for me. So let's get into it. I want to talk to you about your, your new book, We Who Wrestle With God. Yep. A lot of your fans, there's all yep. sorts of Jordan Peterson groups that you can join who debate whether you really believe in God or not. So let's just get it on the table. Do you believe in God? Hmm. <laughs> I don't think that's any of, I don't think that's anybody's business. I think it's the most private question you could ask someone, but then I would say also, uh, what's the right response to that? By their fruits, you will know them. How's that? Well, that's let me ask right you a different, let me ask you a question. different question then. Do you, do you think there is a God? Oh, I'm terrified that there might be, Pierce. How's that? And I, you know, I'm not trying to be a smart ass when I'm making that comment either. Like, they say, it's an, old, it's an Old Testament saying, I believe, that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And that's actually, that is actually about as true a statement as you could manage in such a short phrase. And, you know, people have congratulated me. I was at the Buckley Institute last night. They were congratulating me on my courage. And I think, and I said this last night, it's like, you guys don't understand. It has nothing to do with courage. I'm just afraid of different things than the people who lie. And I'm afraid, for example, of what happens when you lose control of your tongue. And I said that back in 2016 when I first opposed the Canadian government. And people were, you know, congratulating me. It's like, well, you're so brave to stand up to the government. It's like, I'm nowhere near as afraid of the government as I am of what happens when people lose control of their tongue. I studied totalitarianism for, well, since I was 13 years old in depth, and I know what happens when people lose control of their tongue? Mm. What happens is everything goes to hell. And I don't mean, I mean that metaphysically. I mean, might even mean it theologically, but you can just say, don't even bother with that. But what's fascinating- Let's just okay. mean it practically. But what's interesting is, I completely agree with you, by the way. Um, and you are the most open book of almost anyone I've ever interviewed, right to the point I asked you if you believe in God. I didn't actually know what you were gonna say, but for some reason, you're reluctant to say. Why are you reluctant? Well, okay, let's let let's walk along. That. Well, because it's a it's not a it's not a well posed question. It's too complicated an issue to be dealt with like that. You step into instant traps just by accepting the question. So, I'll, I'll show you what I mean. So, the first thing I would say is, what do you mean by believe? Like, do you think that a statement about the existence of God is something like a scientific theory? Do you think it's a list of facts? Is it a factual question? Does God exist or not? Is it a factual question like you're asking about whether a cup on a table exists or a plate on a table, an artifact in a room? What do you mean by this? What do you mean by believe? I'll stake my life on the proposition that God exists. How's that? Well, is that an answer? 
Well, that's no, the right answer. I would ask you, here's my supplementary. Do you ever pray? Guys, if you like this video, if you're getting value from it, then don't forget to leave a like. It only takes you just a second out of your day. And also, if you haven't subscribed already, then hit that beautiful big red button just below. Back to the clips. Always. Who do you pray to? The spirit that protects you from hell. But that, many people would say, is God. Hey. Hey. Sounds good to me. And so you might say, well, I said I pray always. So what does that mean? I'm trying to say the most, the clearest words I can say. And I do that by paying attention. I'm listening to the words and feeling them as I move along, thinking, is that a firm foundation in the morass? Is that a is that a bridge over the abyss? Is that word the right word? I do that when I'm writing. I do that when I'm talking. And I do that because I don't want to be in the abyss. And the pathway over the abyss is the truth. Now, with regards to belief in God, you might say, and I know, I know that, that you're not particularly religiously inclined, at least that's the theory. It's like, well, you have a character, Pierce. Everyone has a character. You could say that would be the spirit of Pierce Morgan. And then we might say, well, let's inquire into that spirit. If you were a hedonist, then the spirit that would be Pierce Morgan would be your hedonistic whims. And that would be your God. I would say if you're a noble person, then your spirit is something elevated above your mere whims. And then there's the spirit that's inculcated within you. It's a consequence, perhaps, of your socialization. But in a more sophisticated way, it's actually a consequence of the spirit that you've allowed as a consequence of your choices to dwell within you. And that spirit has a nature. It might be allied with the truth. It might be allied with falsehood. If it's allied with the truth, it's a manifestation of what has been considered traditionally the logos. The more you're aligned with the truth, the more your spirit is an avatar of the logos. And that's just, it's true. It's religiously true, as it turns out, but it's also technically true. It's technically true. See, I had a debate. And so I'm, going to, I'm making that case in the new book. So at the start of the video, I called Jordan Peterson my internet father. And whilst I am being a comedian as per usual, I also do mean that in a very deep sense. And the ideas that they just spoke about there speak to me very deeply. You see, those of you who have been watching the channel for a while will know that I lost my father when I was a teenager. I was living just for myself with no guidance, engaging in all sorts of debauchery and basically hanging on by a thread waiting to fall off the cliff. I was obese, antisocial, depressed, unhygienic, reclusive, hedonistic, and a comfort creature with absolutely zero purpose. And that all started to change when I met my first boxing coach who taught me discipline and self-respect in the physical and more practical sense. And then when I discovered Jordan Peterson, it was the guidance that I needed to treat myself like somebody that I'm responsible for helping. And then eventually to think about who I could be and aim single-mindedly at that. And I'm going to try and articulate the next bit as well as possible. And I do hope this lands with you guys. But the relationship that I have built with Jordan Peterson and his work over the years, even though he has no idea that I exist, I believe has similarities to the relationship that very religious people describe themselves having with God. Let me try to explain this. When I first discovered Jordan Peterson, as I mentioned, I was a wretch. And over the next five years or so, I wrestled with the ideas that I learned from his lectures like no tomorrow. I butted heads with these ideas because many of them were antithetical to how I was acting. But deep down, I knew that it was the right path. And these ideas and notions that I was learning were such that if I took them seriously, I would have to have a serious, serious look in the mirror and make some changes. And so I would move forward and then stagnate. I would start telling the truth more and then I would stop caring. I would create a vision for myself and then I would give up. I would start cleaning my room every morning and then I would let the mess accumulate. And during these periods where I was moving backwards, I started to notice a pattern emerging. And that was the fact that I hadn't listened to Jordan Peterson in a while. 
And the reason why I hadn't was because I was ashamed. I was ashamed of myself, ashamed of my actions and what I was doing. And more so, I thought that I wasn't worthy of the encouragement that his videos would give me. And I certainly thought I wasn't somebody that could ever earn Dr. Peterson's respect. But every single time I would come back with my tail between my legs and make a little bit of progress, whether I knew it or not. And eventually, after years of this, and it was a small part of my life, but it's a part of my life that I do tend to reflect on quite a bit, I realized that Dr. Peterson was and did a great job of filling a void within me, a void that was left by the passing of my father, who was a great father and who I wish that I could have had that relationship with, but never got to. And it's something that speaking as a young man, I know that all young men have a deep, deep yearning for. And this is why so many people are turning to Jordan Peterson. We innately desire a strong, moral, fearsome, but fair role model. And as I continue to take this idea to its logical conclusion, the idea of the fear of God has become more and more resonant with me. And this notion is something that's becoming more and more apparent every day and plays a part in pretty much all of my decision making. And I don't want to make it sound like I think that Jordan Peterson is some sort of God because it's definitely not what I'm saying. But for me, the fear of Jordan Peterson was the beginning of self-actualization and the fear of my boxing coach was the beginning of discipline. And if you follow that path, it may lead to the ultimate and all encompassing good, which is God. And that may be the beginning of the ultimate virtue, which is in my opinion, wisdom. So I do apologize guys that that was so chaotic articulated but to be honest it's something that I haven't quite wrapped my head around yet myself but I'm thinking about this stuff and learning as I go so it's safe to say that that exchange hit pretty deeply for me and it's just purely my subjective personal life experience I don't know if that even resonates with you guys at all but I'd be very interested if anybody has a similar experience with Jordan Peterson or anybody else that they could share with me let me know in the comments and now to the last part which I also found extremely interesting what do you think I mean you, you've had moments in your life in recent years where I would imagine you have faced the prospect of potentially dying. And in those moments, yeah. in those moments, what have you felt and what do you think happens to you? If you do die or you had died, what, what did you imagine might happen to you? Well, at the, I had lots of moments, moments, years in the last few years where dying would have been an absolute relief. And had that been accompanied by the complete cessation of my being, I would have been perfectly content with that. There are things that are far worse than dying. So if you're only terrified of dying, you've hardly begun to plumb the depths of existential catastrophe. <laughs> well, de death, death is fairly... You just don't have an imagination. What could be worse than dying? Being a prison guard at Auschwitz? But you'd still be alive, even if you were witnessing horror. It's not death that the oh, ultimate... Oh, no. I'm thinking perpetrating it. Right. You mean... Carrying... How, about a, how about being an Auschwitz guard? At a, how about being an Auschwitz guard who really enjoyed his job? Hmm. How about that? That's worse than death, as far as I'm concerned. Right. I mean that. No, no, I, I see that. That's argument. hell, man. Yeah. It's a living hell. That's hell. Yeah, I agree. Mm-hmm. But do you think there so, is? But do you so, think there's an actual hell, Jordan? Is there is there somewhere that people like that go to, which is hell? I don't speculate about such things. I don't. That's where my ignorance finds its. What would you say? That's where my knowledge finds its limit. Huh. I'm I'm concerned enough about what I'm doing right now, right here, and and leaving the rest of that. And you know, I'm. So I have to leave it at that. The hell that I see as a potential on earth is sufficient as a deterrent and it's of, of sufficient reality. You know, you can ask, well, is it eternal? Well, I would say, well, look, all totalitarian states are variants on a theme, let's say, and that theme persists. All archetypal stories are eternal. Everything that happened in the Bible happened and is happening and will continue to happen forever. It's part of the eternal human story. It's hyper real. And, and heaven and hell are part of that. Mm. What that means in the final analysis, I don't know. I mean, you asked, I think you asked in there, you know, there, hell is real, is heaven real? It's like, mm. well, heaven is as far away from hell as you can get. Mm. That's a good way of thinking about right. it. Um, I've spent my whole life trying to determine how you get as far away from being a camp guard at Auschwitz who enjoys his job 
as possible. What is the best and worst thing about being Jordan Peterson? The worst? I'm a bit much. I'm running in all directions very rapidly, and so that can be um, a bit much. It's hard on people around me. I'm a bit much, man. And what's the best thing about you? The best thing about being me? Yeah. It's overwhelming, really. Well, the deep appreciation that people have for what I've been doing. Mm. It's stunning. It's... It's soul destroying, but it's amazing. Is it not soul enhancing? I mean, I feel it when I do interviews with you, the reaction I get from people, just how much you mean to them. I, I mean, I can imagine it. Soul yeah, well, that's a bit much, you know. I mean, look, when I go, wherever I go, it's so strange, eh? Because wherever I go, it's like I have friends there because I walk down the street and people wave at me and, you know, they call up my name and it's a bit much. It's amazing. It's really something, but it's amazing. But it's hard it? to, it's it is. It's hard to, it's hard to wrap my head around it. It's very hard to wrap my head around it, and especially because it happened to me, you know, when I was, well, I didn't when I was older than fifty. It's it's been quite an adjustment. I wouldn't say it's one I've made, and it's an it's an immense responsibility. And I'm not complaining about that, at all. I'd be a fool to complain, an ungrateful fool, but. It's, um, you know, it's a strange thing to have far more than you could ever imagine. What do you mean? Well, that's my life. I have far more than I could ever imagine. Mm. I didn't think it was possible. I mean, you've become somebody who in the later stage of a life. Now you did it again. You got me again, God well, damn it's, it. Yeah, it's it's very interesting. I mean, you are you are an emotional person. I know that. Um, but I think it's also interesting to me what makes you emotional. And it, in a way, it's similar to why you were emotional last time I talked to you, is that you are very acutely aware of the influence you now have over so many millions of people. And I think you feel that responsibility profoundly. And I think that's what triggers it's in you an emotion. It's, yeah, it's gratitude. Yeah. It's an you amazing... know, imagine someone gave you everything you could possibly imagine. Yeah. And more. Well, that's the situation I'm in. And do you find it, do you find it overwhelming sometimes? Always. Always. So guys, I pick on Piers Morgan a lot because to be honest, he's an easy target. But I must say that when he's in his element and when he's not interrupting people, he can be a damn fine interviewer. He asks some great questions and sometimes he really allows his guests to go to the place that shows us who they really are. And last point on this is that I certainly agree with Dr. Peterson there that there are fates a lot worse than hell. If you guys ever find yourself in Cambodia or in that vicinity of the world, then go and check out 12 Slang Prison or The Killing Fields and you'll be able to see just what hell on earth looks like. So on that extremely positive note, I really hope you guys aren't about to go to sleep. If you are, maybe go and watch a video of some rescue dogs being transformed and made over and being really happy. That always tends to be good before bed. And if you guys would like to join the locals community, you can hit that link at the top of the comments. And if you'd like to subscribe to the channel, you can click right here and if you'd like to watch another video right here until next time i'm jake this is rattlesnake tv keeping you armed and dangerous